Hey everybody, it's Avi Tenenbaum. I want to talk about a topic that I rarely talk about on the channel. I want the people following me to get to know me, get to know a little bit more about how I think about things, a little bit more about the man behind different things that I say, pictures that you might see on my Facebook. The main two places that I post stuff on, by the way, is my YouTube and my Facebook, different stuff, so check out both. I want to talk about the idea of being prepared for any eventuality that comes our way. I want to show you how I think and a little bit about the man behind all the disaster work that I do. I want to show you why I'm busy running a campaign right now, raising money to train a bunch of people to defend my neighborhood and our country. I want you to understand and I want you to learn from me and apply these things back at home so that you're safe, okay? I'm going to start by saying that the way I operate is that I assume the worst will happen in every scenario, and then I prepare accordingly, okay? That's the opposite of pretending nothing will ever happen, and then being caught unprepared when something happens. Now, I'm not telling you to assume the world is about to come to an end at every moment. I'm not telling you to live in fear and anxiety. I'm not necessarily telling you to do anything drastic or expensive or scary. What I'm going to show you is that I try to live smart. And I'm going to explain what I mean. It's going to take a few minutes, so follow me and I will lead you through all of this, okay? I studied about disasters, not only from the perspective of psychology, disaster behavioral health, leadership, also as a first responder, as an EMT in the pre-hospital medicine world, I understand disaster and emergency because I'm an EMT and I go to emergency calls as an EMT. I have in my trunk medical gear. I also understand emergencies from the level of being a volunteer sergeant in the Israeli police, driving a police car with a patrol rifle and lights and sirens, driving sometimes in the opposite direction of traffic to interdict a car, check somebody, set up checkpoints, respond to terror attacks. Okay, so from different angles, being a first responder, having trained first responders for many years, having been around them, cross-training, dabbling in search and rescue trainings. I'm around. I'm also a concealed carry person. I carry a gun every single day, all day, until I go to sleep. So weapons, the idea of when you can open fire on somebody and protect your family. Not that I'm a lawyer, but just as an armed citizen, okay? So being that person as well. I, I think I weighed my gear at one point before the war. I think my daily gear that I carry on my belt and on my person is like five or six pounds. And that's before the war. And with the war, I carry even more stuff, okay? So the idea of something might happen. Will it happen? Will an earthquake happen? Will the house set on fire? Will somebody open fire on us with a Kalashnikov rifle? Will there be a tsunami? There either will be or there won't be. I see in the world of preparedness, there are all sorts of people, all sorts of approaches. Each one has a pro and con, but there's even a movement in the world. It's called preparism, survivalism, I'm going to get into this now. I want you to follow me. It's an interesting discussion. You'll learn more about me. You'll learn more about why I'm making a campaign to train people to prepare to defend my neighborhood during a war. And I want you to learn from me. You don't have to agree with me. I'm always an unconditional friend. Take what you want from what I say. Leave the rest. What I'm going to talk about has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with America. It has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. I'll explain what I mean and why I'm giving that uh, declaration so you understand. 
It has to do with preparedness and being a human in 2023. With that introduction, let's jump in. So let's say that you live in a home. Most people do. And you care about your life. Most people do. And comes somebody at 3.30 in the morning and starts breaking down your door and trying to get in. What do you do? I'll tell you what people do in 2023. They call the police. Now, I don't care what country you're from. Without looking at the recent statistics, I will guess that it takes time for police to get to your house. It might be three minutes, it might be 10 minutes, it might be 25 minutes, but it takes time for police to get to your house, okay? Somebody that was beloved to me was in a terror attack. They were murdered. How long did it take for police to arrive on scene at that terror attack that happened a number of years ago where there were two people, one with a gun, and one with an ax. How long did it take? In a big urban center where there are tons of police, how long did it take for a policeman to get on scene? Five minutes. It was a very untrained policeman relative to the more trained ones that have special training for this. Of course, we have SWAT team type units. Who was the first one that came? A traffic cop. And he came alone. And he was a hero, okay? And he started fighting by himself, and then other people came, and other people came, and eventually the terrorists were killed, okay? But it took five minutes. So to quote John Correa, who's a famous YouTuber in the world of self-defense, he says, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. When seconds count, the police are only minutes away. I don't know if that's his original quote or he's quoting it from somebody else. He has a channel, Active Self-Protection. Very nice channel. Used to be nice. Don't know what it's like now. I, I know it changed over the years, but it used to be a great channel. But when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. I could tell you as a person that drives in police cars, drives the car itself, and goes to very violent crimes, very dangerous calls, where there's a report of a terror attack or somebody trying to murder somebody else or a robbery or somebody romping around the streets with a gun, it can take us 10 to 15 minutes to arrive. And it's not necessarily anybody's fault. It's 3 p.m. You're in a congested urban center. There are cars everywhere. How do you want a car to magically skip traffic. This is not a hover car that goes up above cars and flies in the air and lands. We don't have an attack helicopter. We have a car, right? Should the police force have people on motorcycles to solve this? Yes, and they do, in fact. But it still takes them time to get there because maybe they were just on a call from the other end of town and now they have to get all the way to here. You can spin it however you want. But to think that when you need somebody to come in 10 seconds to your house, that they're going to come in 10 seconds, it's a lie. That's on the level of law enforcement and security. And let's talk about as an EMT, which is another hat that I wear. And let's say somebody is bleeding to death because they were in a serious car accident. And you find this person because you were driving on the road, or you hit this person, or you love this person, they were in your car. Or you were a truck driver and you mauled their Toyota Corolla, which is mangled in pieces. Do you know how to stop the bleed? Do you know how to put on a tourniquet? Do you know how to pack wounds? Do you know how to put on a chest seal? Do you have one? Do you know how to fabricate these items if you need? Okay. Do you know how to stop bleeding in different parts of the body? And the body is a very strange shape, right? It's not a cube. It's not a bowl. What if somebody's bleeding here or here or from their groin, from their leg? There's a different solution for every part of the body. What if somebody's choking and you're a nurse or a, an aide in an old age home or you're taking care of your grandma 
her visiting her grandma, and she starts choking on a piece of chicken. Do you know how to do the Heimlich? Do you know how to do CPR if grandma dies? Can you resuscitate her? Do you have a defibrillator? And what I'm saying is, what do you do in that case in 2023? You call the ambulance. Great solution, call the ambulance. How long does it take for an ambulance to get there? Five minutes, three minutes? And that's in a very developed country. In other countries or during difficult times of day when there's nobody around or when everybody's around and it's congested, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe you live in a rural area, 25 minutes, 45 minutes, okay? So the fantasy that grandma's dying and you're going to magically have a paramedic or EMT show up and you're going to magically have them keep all their blood in without knowing how or having any gear on you. And you're going to magically have police there in two seconds at 3.30 in the morning to stop a psychopath from breaking down your door and trying to hurt you. You don't even know if he's going to hurt Maybe he just wants to steal. You don't even know. The chances of that are zero. What happened is we as human beings, I'm saying this not as a historian, not as an expert. You can fact check me. You can write this in the comments. It'll be interesting, okay? I'm not making a claim as a historian. It's an assumption. And it's an assumption that I read from experts in books. But there's an assumption that in older societies and cultures in the past around the world, we were more self-reliant as people. That's probably a scientifically true fact because it's recorded across multiple cultures in many disciplines, okay? We were more reliant as people. Somebody once said to me, Avi, 150 years ago in Poland, in Lithuania, in Morocco, in Ireland, in Japan, where did women give birth? At home. Where did people die? On their deathbed, because they were sick, because they were old. At home. Where do people give birth and die today? Not in every culture, but in the lucky ones that are developed and they have good medicine. Where do they give birth and die? In hospitals. And who do you call if there's a security issue? The police. And who do you call if somebody's invading your country? The army. And who do you call if there's a medical issue? The doctor, the ambulance. If there's some sort of issue, a chemical issue, who comes to clean it up and fix it and deal with it? Hazmat, hazardous material experts, firefighters. Somebody falls down a huge ravine, their truck tumbles down and they're stuck inside and they call the police, they're alive. They call the ambulance. Who goes down this dangerous, complicated place to get them? Search and rescue. This is all new stuff in 2023. It's wonderful. It does a lot of good. I know it does. You don't have to convince me. But dare us not let it replace ourselves. It has to be in addition to ourselves. Because you're with grandma and she's choking on chicken. You can't wait five minutes for the ambulance to come. And that's in a very developed area where you're not living in ruralville, nowheresville in America or Europe or wherever, or Northern Israel. There's no hospitals there. There's one hospital. There's nothing. In some areas, there's nothing. Nowheresville. You live in Yerucham, I think, right? Yerucham or... Um, what is it? Where do they say the nukes are in Israel? I'm forgetting the name of the place right now. Okay. I've been to these places. Nowheresville. The closest hospital is far away. You're lucky if you have some medics around, EMTs, but it takes time. They were just transporting somebody to the hospital. And until they check that person in and come back, it's going to take an hour, 40 minutes. Okay. What if 
you call the police or ambulance and the phone doesn't work. Oh, Avi, that never happens. It happened in Israel, where I'm sitting right now, which is a very developed country, two days ago. From two in the morning till eight in the morning, and some people say from two in the morning to 5.30 in the morning, I'm not sure what's accurate, but for a few hours, you couldn't call the fire department, you couldn't call the ambulance, you couldn't call the police. There was some sort of backup number through SMS that would still work, and no one knew about that. Okay? This is 2023. When we place our trust in politicians, in organizations, in bureaucracy, in people that don't know your grandma or don't know you personally, and they're coming from across town, you are giving your life into the hands of other people. Now, you hope that the people that are paid to protect and serve you and, and save you care about you and are well trained and well equipped and well staffed you hope but i promise you it's not always the case and i know this because i travel around the world and train first responders i've seen what ambulances are like in some areas of south africa i've seen what certain police departments are like i don't want to give names okay they have nothing in some areas of the world they're outmanned they're outgunned they're under-equipped. They don't have enough police, police cars, enough staff, enough rifles, enough radios. I know what I'm talking about. I've been around the world a little bit. Never been to South America. Still haven't been there. Haven't been to England somehow, so you got to invite me to give a course in England. But I've been around, especially in Eastern Europe. I've been to a lot, many countries. I've been to a bunch of places in America, many states in America. I've been around. Okay? What I'm saying is, yes, call the police. Yes, call the ambulance. Yes, build an army. Please, don't let it replace yourself. And then wind up with nothing in the end. It's not wise. Okay? That's the idea of being self-reliant. There is a movement, you can call it a hobby, but there's a hobby sort of movement called prepperism, survivalism, and it's people that are always preparing for disasters and negative situations because they assume that bad things will happen because why wouldn't they happen? Because statistically, they sometimes happen, and I want to be prepared for when they happen. Now, in that world of prepping, of survivalism, of preparing for disasters, in this social world which has magazines and YouTube channels and WhatsApp groups and Facebook pages, and in that world, there are extremists and there are more practical, calm people, and then the people in the middle. There's a spectrum, just like in any social group. Okay. There are people that are fear-mongering. And they live as if they're about to die every second and they're full of anxiety and they're preparing for Armageddon and feeling that way emotionally. And some people call them the tin tinfoil hat people, I think is sometimes how they're referred to on the internet. And they're busy buying full nuclear biological chemical suits and they can't even pay their bills at home. And they're busy buying these things before they could lease their expensive car and their whole life is in disarray and they're kind of disconnected from reality. There are people that do that responsibly because their life is in order and they have the extra money and the ability. It's a hobby anyways. It's interesting. You learn new things, no problem. Buy some nuclear radiation suits. I don't have a problem with it. Be prepared. Buy some potassium iodide, which I bought. 15 bucks. It helps you from radiation exposure from nuclear fallout. $15. Okay, I'll invest in that. There are ways of doing it that are better, ways of doing it that are worse. I live my life as a first responder and as a father and as a husband and as a citizen and as a friend, and as a professional, assuming bad things will happen. Not because I want them to happen, but because in the world, in statistics, in the reality of the world that we live in, they just, they happen. 
So if you live in Ruralsville, California, with massive, beautiful trees surrounding your house, there's a decent chance you're going to run into a forest fire. And you should prepare for that. You should learn about escape routes. You should figure out whatever the experts in your area tell you about forest fires and how to prepare and how to be safe. You should implement that. If you live in Israel, you should be prepared for wars because we constantly have them and terror attacks even when there aren't wars because we constantly have them. Intifadas, uprisings, skirmishes, wars, all of those. Because that's our disaster that we have all the time, including right now. And to learn what does that mean that there's a war? It means it can affect your family. What can affect your family? Rockets, precision guided rockets, unguided rockets. That's one level. How else can it affect you? Just for example, right? You can have marauding terrorists in Toyotas driving around the neighborhoods trying to go door to door killing people. Oh, Avi, that never happens. Well, it just happened. It happened that's over seven. The people that did it say that they'll do it again. We know that the people in Hezbollah have a whole unit preparing to do that to Israel. It's called Brother Juan. We know that there are Iraqis that came into Syria that they want to do it. We have Yemenites that want to do it. There, there's no shortage of people that want to do it. There's people that are affiliated in the West Bank with different terror groups that they want to do it. The Muslim Brotherhood. Some people affiliated with the Palestinian Authority that they want to do it. So there's no shortage of people calling for our death. So why not prepare for that? Why not prepare for that? That's our forest fire. If you live in a coastal town, wherever you live, why wouldn't you assume that there's going to be a hurricane? If you look in your city's history, every X amount of years, your experts will tell you there's some sort of hurricane, a storm, maybe even a tsunami. Why not prepare for that? If you live near a dormant volcano, why wouldn't you assume that might one day erupt? It might erupt and make decisions based on that. Now you want to know what decisions to make, what equipment to buy. Big discussion. We can make a whole channel about this. It's, it's, it's something that I enjoy talking about. I never talk about it. But when you see me making a video about preparing for an invasion of my country and protecting my family, because the first campaign that I did like a month ago, that also that video is on this channel, that was more in general for people that are going to protect areas around here, but it's not necessarily going to directly help me and protect my family. It's going to help a lot of communities. We raised $18,000. That was great, okay? I'm raising money now to take that money and spend it on training items that I already purchased to then start a training course tomorrow with an expert trainer in defensive urban tactics. And we're going to learn about how if terrorists come to these streets where I'm sitting, in pickup trucks or on foot or on motorcycle, here's how we can respond as citizens, not trying to replace the police, not the army, not the SWAT team, but just as people that we have a volunteer security unit under the auspices of the police. And we live here and our families are here. How could I not prepare for that? I'm, I'm literally living in a war zone. And it's not the first war zone I've been to. And it's not the first war I've been in. It's not the first intifada I've been in. And there are businesses that lie to you. I know I'm going to jump topics, but bear with me. It's at least going to be an interesting video. There are businesses that will lie through their teeth to you and pretend to sell you products that will protect you, that will barely do anything for you, like pepper spray. If you can't get a gun, I understand. So you can't get a gun, so you might as well get some pepper spray, maybe. I've used pepper spray on people in a lawful way. It doesn't do anything. And certainly if the pepper spray that you're using shoots like one or two meters away, Complete joke. Oh, and by the way, pepper spray can like blow back onto you. So if you're in America, there's all sorts of solutions. There's better types. There's pepper gel. There's bear spray. You guys have cool equipment. No problem. You live in Israel where there's such regulation on everything. You can't even get a gun here. 
I only have a gun because I'm a first responder, okay? People will sell all sorts of ridiculous products that promise security that it doesn't provide. You know what provides security more than almost anything? Situational awareness. That will solve like 90% of the things that will endanger you because you are aware of shooting and you quickly go away or hide and you learn how to hide and where to hide and what that means. Mike Glover was one of the preppers in the world on the more pragmatic side of prepping. Mike Glover always says he hates the protocol of run, fight, and hide because you never really teach people how to fight. Run, okay, run. When do you run? Are there times that you shouldn't run? You should teach that. Hide. Where do you hide? Look at videos on the internet. You see people hiding from mass shooters under a desk that everybody sees or behind an aisle of cans that you just walk around and you see the person there. Is that called hiding? Is that effective? It's not effective. So when we teach these things, we're providing a feeling of safety, but not real safety. It's fluff. I could tell you that there's a policing strategy around the world in a lot of places where when things happen like mass shootings, wars, the police have an agenda to make people feel safe and they'll put on a show. They'll have a few token people walk around doing token things with token little vests and lights and people will say, oh, now I'm safe. But if you understand what security is and how security works, what does that do for you? You always have to ask, what's the function of something? If I have a, no offense to anyone, okay? But if I have a 65-year-old overweight security guard who barely speaks the language of his own country, who carries an old outdated pistol and 10 extra bullets, who's on his phone, what that does is waste your money because it makes you feel safe, which is a nice psychological gimmick. I'm very into psychology. I, I teach things about making people feel safe, but it's a gimmick. Because can he make you safe or can he make you just feel safe? Big difference, okay? We can have some sort of token performance by all sorts of people to make you feel good at night when you go to sleep, or we can understand what security actually is and learn how to create it. I'm going to tell you my version. In 2023, November 29, living in a country that's at risk of invasion, war, and terrorism, and I'm not a spring chicken, and I've been around the block, and I've seen a lot of things, and I'm involved in law enforcement. I've been around, guys. I've been around. I've been to plenty of terror attacks. I've been around. Here's my version of safety for my own neighborhood. And I can't even do all of it. But ideally, you have a gate around the community, which we can't have a gate around our community. I live in a massive neighborhood. We have almost 100,000 people here. So this is not a little town with a gate. Okay, so no gate. And ideally, we'll have some sort of response unit here and ideally, they'll be trained, and ideally, they'll have enough ammunition, and ideally, they'll have the laws that allow them to respond to incidents and not be afraid to shoot back, and we'll have proper lighting on the perimeter of our neighborhood, especially in the very dark areas, especially in the areas where enemies live and often come up into the neighborhood from the darkness and from the forests. We don't have nine-tenths of what I just said. In my neighborhood, what we had was a bunch of random people, most who are not in shape and have zero training, who have barely touched their weapons, who, who knows how they got the weapon, but somehow they got permission to get this weapon and it sits in their safe three years at a time. It collects dust. And then every three years, they do a token symbolic training where they shoot at a piece of paper 10 times and now it's renewed for another three years. You want those people protecting your kids right now? They don't know anything. And if you told me that he was a 
amazing shooting Olympic performer. He can shoot targets from 500 feet away. Incredible. He can shoot fast. Incredible. So what is he, a one-man army? Does he know tactics? What if they're shooting at him? Yeah, he's an Olympic shooter. He's got good aim. Wonderful. It's impressive. I, I don't have good aim, okay? Could he shoot at somebody shooting at him and know how to deal with the stress of that? And can he move while he does it? And what if there are 20 terrorists, like 20 terrorists came into Opakim, or 70 terrorists that came into Re'im at one point in the initial wave, because there was a lot more after that. And, and please forgive me for the numbers if they're off. Stay real, 40 terrorists. Sometimes in the middle of my recordings, I have to take uh, emergency phone calls. Sorry about that. Where were we? I think where we were was, the point is that when you have a family, when you have a street, a neighborhood, security isn't a random thing that's magical in the air. It's something specific. I learned many disciplines over the years. I learned theology and philosophy. I learned business. I learned psychology, sociology, anthropology. I learned disaster management, um, etc. When you learn many disciplines, you see that there are certain universal patterns throughout all wisdoms. I really see that. If you want to make money, you can't just wish to have money. You have to have a way to create the money, right? And you have to be specific. So let's say you say, I want to make money through a dry cleaning app. Very specific. And here's my competition. And here's how we're going to do our differentiation. And here's what we're going to do that everyone's going to know in advance that it's a no-brainer. They should take us over everybody else. And this is our unique way of marketing. And this is our unique product. And this is our unique message that we give people and packaging and and, and, and the way we'll, we're going to answer the phone, our pricing, everything is specific. And, and when you make it specific, then you start to create money. You start to create wealth. Okay, we brought this business to this country. Now we can duplicate it to that country. Well, then you have to be specific there too. How much do people make in that country? What are the habits of people in that country and their culture? Do they even do dry cleaning in that country? Could they afford your prices? right? Everything has to be specific. And if you scale things specifically and target things and sell things in a specific way, you can make money doing a dry cleaning business. Alex Hormozy, who's one of my favorite business gurus that I like to follow, says that every market, not every market, but almost every market, unless it's a dying market, is a legitimate market to make money if you think in a specific way strategically of how to make money. It could be pizza. It could be selling socks. It could be public speaking. You can make money, but you have to be specific. Okay? When we talk about security of your family, it has to be specific. What is security? What's safety? Well, what can hurt you? What are the threats to your safety? Let's look at that. Fires, floods, Whatever is in your area, because every area is different. Every area is different. My house is not very likely to have a forest fire burn it down because there's no forest around except a small forest kind of a few minutes away. And it will burn out and then reach some houses. It's And our houses are made out of stone. It's, it's, it's not likely, okay? A tsunami can't get to my house because I don't live anywhere near water. An earthquake may happen. In Israel, they say on average, there's a dangerous earthquake every 100 years. Okay. And that's every 100 years. What happens every few months? A terror attack. Okay. A house fire because of an electrical something malfunctioned and there's a, God forbid. Okay, that could happen. So now we're getting specific. What can threaten your family? Grandma can choke. People get old and their muscles aren't the same anymore and their teeth aren't the same anymore, and they could choke, okay? So you wanna get specific. 
you have a daughter and she's pretty and she walks out at night. Well, somebody can prey on your pretty daughter at 10 at night in an par empty parking lot and she's 17 years old, right? That's a threat. What do you do about that threat? How do you create safety? You have young children in a school. Somebody can molest them. That's a threat. That's a legitimate possible threat, right? Look at the statistics of sexual abuse of kids in schools. It's, it's nuts. From other kids, from teachers, from family. So you want to anticipate what can threaten you, your loved ones, your street, your neighborhood, your city, your country. Each person, depending on how much ability you have to influence. If you're the leader of your country, you should be thinking about what can threaten your country. You should be having summits with other great leaders in the world about what threatens the world. Okay. If you're not that great of a person, influence-wise, and you don't have 9 million viewers on YouTube, but you have a family, and you're a parent, and you can influence the three people in your family, you want to get smoke detectors, you want to get fire extinguishers, whatever the firefighters suggest that you do, you should do. Whatever your home front command or National Guard or health officials or FEMA, whatever they suggest that you do for... That was a sneeze, unanticipated sneeze. Whatever your officials, your experts suggest that you do to prepare for danger or how to take care of grandma, what might grandma need, right? I know that a lot of elderly people in developed countries have some sort of button, a bracelet, and they can press it and, and ask for help. As a first responder, I've been to older people's houses or physically disabled people's houses that they've been lying on a floor for 20 hours in a row, unable to get help. And they had no way to move and to call for help. So we give them a necklace, a bracelet, some sort of way to call for help. We teach the neighbor to knock on their door every day and make sure they're okay, etc. So we want to anticipate what can threaten this person, this grandma, this family, this street, and then solve for X. Now, it doesn't mean you have to live your life in anxiety. I do not have anxiety. I'm a very calm person and a very happy person, okay? I don't do this all day, all night, but I want to be a wise person. A wise person means where they're going to be, theoretically, no power and no power to run pumps to clean water because there was a cyber attack, a missile attack, which Iran can do both through their proxies and directly. How am I going to drink clean water? You know that Iran did a cyber attack on Israel? and they put dangerous amounts of chlorine or fluoride or something in the water. I don't remember what it was. And it would have made everybody sick. They did that cyber from far away. What if somebody finds out and people get sick and now I can't drink the water for a few days? Well, what am I supposed to do? Not drink water? So the answer is, I have a surplus of water in my house. Well, what if there's an uprising? The answer is, I have things for that, okay? Well, Avi, what if grandma chokes? Well, for that, hopefully the person that's watching grandma knows how to do the Heimlich maneuver, knows the number of the ambulance to call right away, okay? We need to be the agent of change. We need to be our own guardian angel. It doesn't replace the police or fire department or army. It's in, it's in addition to, but it has to be in addition to. Because I could tell you again, police will come to your house 10 minutes after you wanted them there. Ambulance will come five or seven minutes after you wanted them there. So it's not to insult anybody, but it's just a fact. There's no power for several days. How will you cook? How will you cook if your infrastructure is shut down because of some sort of natural disaster that's likely to happen in your area? And the answer is, if you did something about that in advance, then that's the answer. You have a emergency stove. You have some little gas canisters and a little pot and some extra pasta or rice. 
and some water that you put away. Well, now you can cook independently some rice for your family, right? You can put canned food away for two or three years. You can learn how to store food for 25 years. I mean, the internet's filled with interesting know-how. I learned this stuff for a few reasons. One is because it's just part of my job as a first responder, also in the law enforcement security hat, also in the medical hat, also that I go to disaster zones and speak to people in disaster zones. And so I might wind up in a place that just had a forest fire or just had uh, some sort of attack or something. I need to learn about it because it's part of my job. I studied these things in university. I studied about disaster management and, and leadership, crisis leadership. But also because I have a family, I brought people into the world. I promised a woman that I married that I would protect her. It was implicit. I didn't say that, you know, the day that I married her, I will protect you. I didn't say those words, but that's an understanding that we have. How am I going to be there for my family? I brought them into the world. I have them rely on me and trust me that I'll look after them as a father, as a husband, as a good neighbor, as a brother, as a son. How am I going to fulfill my duty if I don't even know how to do that? If I'm just a liability, I'm not even an asset. I just wear down the system. I'm just another panicked, unprepared person that just makes things worse. That's not helpful. It's not helpful. So my friends and I and some people that I follow on the internet and different experiences that I've had and gear that I bought, all that together comes and says, security doesn't come out of thin air. Security comes from understanding where you're unsafe, how it works that you're unsafe. Ah, on the side of your neighborhood, there's a dark forest. And on the other side of that forest are people that will go unnamed that are swearing to kill us. Okay, so you have an undefended border. And the other side of it is not a peaceful neighborhood, but people that want to hurt you. They talk about it. It's been recorded. It's been delivered to the police information that they want to kill us and hurt us. It's undefended. It's dark. There's no gate. There's no lights. There's no cameras. There's nothing there. Well, okay, you don't have a gate to keep him out. You certainly have no deterrence because you don't act as a country in a way that creates any sort of deterrence. You certainly don't have laws very much on your side that give you much ability to do much to anyone about anything if they would try to hurt you. Okay, so we don't have the laws. There's no right to bear arms. Okay, so almost nobody has guns. And the people that have guns have no training. Yeah. It's irresponsible. It's irresponsible. Okay, if I was the king of this country, I would decree everybody has the right to bear arms. And don't you dare buy a gun if you don't pass a 100-hour course in gun safety, in tactics, you have to be mentally well, physically well, and have the willingness and the courage to use it properly and to defend your nation and your family and to defend yourself from yourself. Were you to be in a depression, be enraged? We don't want to see mass shootings. We don't want to see women killed or anybody killed because of a gun. There's got to be some responsibility and training that goes with it, right? But let everybody have that chance. And you know who's going to take a 100-hour course and pass some security checks and stuff like that? Serious people. The people that invest in something. Will it be perfect? It won't be perfect because nothing in the world is perfect. But it will be better than now. You know what it's like now? Nobody has the right to a gun, except certain people, depending on where they live, or if they're a first responder, if they were once in the military, certain people that were once in the military. Okay, you have the right now to buy a gun in my country, but no training is needed. So you can be a complete moron. You don't even know how to pull your gun out. You don't know how to shoot it safely. You have no training. And if you got basic training one time, three years go by and you know nothing. 
when it comes to first aid, if you're a teacher in my country, you have to do a 44 hour kit course in first aid and you have to recertify it often. If you buy a gun, you hear two and a half hours of a lecture about some laws and then you shoot a piece of paper for half an hour and you leave. So tell me now, if I have a bunch of random people who are overweight, they don't have a tactical mind, they have zero training, and every three years they shoot a piece of paper from 10 feet away, 10 meters away. Does this make them that now our neighborhood is prepared from an invasion or a terror attack? If he's in the mall and he sees somebody stabbing somebody else, is he more skillful now that he can shoot the bad guy and not shoot the little girl behind him or less skillful? Is he an asset or a liability? You understand? And that's why I'm doing trainings. Oh, well, Avi, the police should give these trainings. No. Nah. Well, the, the, the army should give these trainings. Well, the, the, the government should give these trainings. The Interior Ministry of Defense should give these trainings. Yeah, maybe they should. They're the ones that give out guns. They should give it the training then, but they don't. They have you shoot a piece of paper from 30 feet away every three years. How do I certify in the police on a rifle? I stand 30 feet away, and if I hit a piece of cardboard enough times, and I could take my time. So over like a minute and a half, if I shoot a piece of cardboard enough times, I don't know if it's like 51% of the times or 70% of the times, that's it. Does that mean I now know how to operate with my police partner to come together as a unit and close the distance between us and attacker and there's a shopping mall and I'm going to take an M16 or an M4 carbine and I'm going to start shooting it now in a mall full of people. I have some training, but is it thorough? Is it the training you want to protect your family? Eh. Okay. So I have a rule. And the rule is if you don't do it, it won't happen. If you don't go and build it, it won't be built. If you don't fundraise for it, you won't have money. If you don't talk about it, it won't be spoken about. This is a guiding principle in my life. I am in WhatsApp groups from the beginning of this war that are infuriating because I see people that live in my area and they're kibitzing all day. WhatsApp warriors saying, oh God, we're so unsafe. Somebody should do something. And I wrote back five or six times since the beginning of the war, somebody should do something. What do you want to do about it? What action do you want to take? Why don't you get a quote today from a security company to come to your house and assess how safe your house is, the front of it, the back of it, the street. Do this with some neighbors. Have them come a full day to five or six of your neighbors on both sides of the street. Put up cameras. Install sensors. Put up lights. Learn how security works. People are breaking into your house. We, you know how many break-ins we had this week? And we have videos of people walking in from that forest doing whatever they want. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. Who are you going to call the police? They'll come in a few minutes. And then what? You'll be hunkering down in your bed. You might not even know about it. Because you're busy sleeping and they, you know, open the window and open the door. And before you know it, they're in your house. You might not even know that they're in your house. There was just a break in and the, the criminals were there for 40 minutes straight in the house. That's a long time to be in someone's house. So people don't even want to spend the money that they have in their bank accounts because it's a somewhat okay community, middle class community. They have money for some cameras. They have the power to write, but not to do. The only thing in this world that will save you and your family is you. Is that guaranteed? Nothing is guaranteed. You need God's help. At the end of the day, we need God's help. I'm a religious person, a spiritual person. I have faith. We pray. We ask for God's help. But God doesn't randomly save people that are so lazy that they don't participate in their own salvation. They won't even do anything. A fire comes and kills a bunch of people. Oh, how did God do this to us? Well, you had an electric bike battery that all the firefighters in every country are saying don't leave plugged in overnight. 
And he had no fire extinguisher, which I'm not even saying would have worked on that battery. You need a special extinguisher. I don't know anything about this, so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. He had no smoke detectors. You never made a plan with your family about how to escape if there was a fire. So you brought something dangerous and risky into your house, but you were too lazy to prepare. So it doesn't work that way. So for me, my hands are tied. Everybody's hands in this world are tied. We're all limited. Not all of us can fight or get a gun or have the money to have elaborate defense systems. I understand. I'm a very regular person that is from a very regular family, not a wealthy family. I'm not wealthy. I get it. We're all limited. I'm in a very bureaucratic country. I understand. But there's always things that you could do. And like I said before, 90% of the cure is the prevention. The saying says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So I have random people that are unfit and untrained in my neighborhood. How useful is that? Were there to be an attack? Not very. Well, what if we organize them together? Okay, that's useful. Now I organize them. They're still all unfit and untrained. Guys, there are six terrorists at the corner. Well, now what? So you know what's going to happen? Some people are going to drive right up to them and get shot and killed. That's not very useful. Other people aren't trained, so they have no confidence, no, no familiarity of you know being shot at, which you can get training for with simulation training. I've done that. Paintball training, airsoft training, martial arts training. I did Krav Maga, and one of my favorite exercises was we all punched each other in the head for five minutes straight. 30, 40 people in the gym, some sort of helmet on, or or no helmets, or just you know um, punching gloves, punching each other in the head for five minutes straight. And you get socked in the head a bunch of times. That's a great training. I've gotten whipped before by my friend who I'm doing my campaign with. Look at my fundraiser. Look at my previous video. Look at my fundraiser I'm doing with Chaim Mandel, my martial arts teacher. He's whipped me before with cattle whips. That hurts. But you learn pain tolerance. You learn to engage danger and not to go like this, which never saved anyone in history. Okay? L Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman says in his books On Combat and On Killing, yeah. fascinating books, that the way to the way to sorry i'm getting distracted because i'm seeing all sorts of messages on my screen i'm going to tell you uh the sheepdog metaphor one of the most important metaphors sometimes people give it a religious spin it doesn't have to be religious the sheepdog metaphor is very simple this is from an army psychologist lieutenant colonel dave grossman who's not Jewish, by the way, great guy. He says, and it's not even his idea, he's quoting it from, I think from a Vietnam colonel, somebody like this in the United States Army. There are two types of people. You have sheep and you have wolves. And the sheep are the everyday citizens and the soccer moms and the regular people watching this video. You're just a regular person. You're a good person. You have a business. You have a family. You have a job. You just want to go about your business and be nice to other people and want people to be nice to you. Most people are like that. But it takes a very small number of people to hurt a lot of other people. Gang members, rapists, pedophiles, murderers, terrorists, etc. Okay, drunk drivers, those people are dangerous people, right? And those people can kill the good people. It's a problem. So those are the wolves that can eat the sheep. Not good. You don't want to be eaten. You don't want your daughter who's attractive and healthy, looks nice, and it's 10 p.m. at night and she's in a parking lot. You don't want somebody to rape your daughter or abduct and rape and kill her. You don't want that. It's not pleasant. Okay, so there's a wolf and there's a sheep. Rapist, daughter. Rapist, daughter. Rapist has a gun 
or a knife, and he's very strong, he's big, or he's intimidating, 17-year-old girl. Who's going to win? So you have a solution, and that's the sheep dog. And the sheep dog is similar to the wolf and similar to the sheep. He has a component of both. Because the sheep have morals. They're good people. And the sheep dog has morals. And the wolf has a capacity for violence. And the sheep dog has a capacity for violence. Because if you watch any video on YouTube of a sheep dog chasing wolves away from sheep, that's his job. He can get in a fight with a with a wolf or a fox. He can chase away some predators. And he will never eat the sheep. They did studies on soldiers in several countries and found that they're not any more likely to commit crimes from the simple fact that they're a soldier. Well, why not? They killed people. They stabbed people, grenaded people, rocketed people, blew people up with their tank, shot people with their rifle. Why are they not more likely to kill people? Why don't they all become wolves? Simple answer. Because they were trained to be violent within the context of morals, order, and rank. You know what happens to the army if you disobey an order? You go to jail. So those men and women in the armed forces learn, we shoot people and kill them within the context of morals, within the context of rules and superiors and laws, international laws, local laws, telling us when, where, and how, okay? That's the job of the sheepdog. That's his role. A police officer doesn't randomly kill people. I don't care what you say. I know the nicest, greatest people who are police officers, and I work with them, and I myself am a police officer voluntarily. A lot of times, we don't randomly kill people. There are rules, and we work within those rules. And if we don't work within those rules, people get fired, people get jailed, okay? And it's happened. It's happened. I know it's happened. It's certainly not the rule. It's the exception to the rule. My father is a social worker who has run in the past two homeless shelters and a massive program for the people who are poor and unwell and uh, disadvantaged people in a massive inner city place in the United States. He's worked with the police for 40 years as a social worker. He says he has never had one negative altercation with the police. They've always been the nicest professionals to him and his clients, and they've helped his clients' quality of life a hundredfold. And that's my experience here, okay? So you have people that they have rules, and within those rules, they do certain things. As an EMT, we can cut off people's clothing. We could go through their pockets sometimes, very rare, but we can, if we have to, see what they just took and why they overdosed. We might have to explain if their wallet is missing, who went into their pocket, why and for how long. So you have to check your laws and you have to make sure that all your team sees Guys, I'm going through his pocket to see if he has pills in his pocket to see what he just took. But we could do that. We can take off people's clothing with the scissors, trauma shears, just cut off their underwear, check if they're wounded down there. We could do that. But we can only do that in a certain context. There was a car accident. The guy is bleeding in three places, and he might be bleeding in two more places. Okay. So we have certain permissions that we're allowed to do within the context of law rank, order, organization, etc. Okay? The sheepdog are the brave men and women, whether they are the people that prepare bodies for burial, whether they're the emergency room nurses, whether it's the social workers, whether it's the ambulance corps, the police, whether it's the army, search and rescue, firefighters, it's those brave people that they're willing to face very uncomfortable things, gruesome sights and smells, things that will cause them trauma. 
things that might put their life in danger, like going into a burning building or dangling on a rope down the side of a building to help a suicidal person that might even stab you. Who knows what they'll do? You don't know if they're psychotic. You don't know what their story is. They're sitting on a ledge on the 65th floor of a building. And a, and a trained person will rappel down and try to do something, right? Those are the sheep dogs. And they're there to fight the wolves and protect the sheep. That's their job. Okay? Those people are born thinking differently than you. And, and thank God for that. Because otherwise, I promise you, nobody would save anybody. Because if there's a fatal car accident, who's going to come and stop the bleed if you're afraid of blood? If you're a paramedic and you're afraid of blood, or you're afraid to see something scary, you're just not going to go. You're not even going to sign up for this job. Okay? So sheepdogs are people that are designed a bit differently or conditioned, or they condition themselves to be this way. There's a lot of ways to talk about it, big discussion. And they're able to go to the front lines. A SWAT team member is able to go into a building with hostages and gunmen and head on in a professional way with all the knowledge and expertise that they have and deal with that threat. How incredible. You wouldn't do that, but they would do it. And they'll do it for you. They might even die doing it for you. Their wives might become widows doing it for you. Their kids might become orphans doing it for you, but they'll do it for you. That's their job. And they're willing to do it, and they get satisfaction out of doing it. And thank God for that. Because the world needs them. Because how can they have a world without that, right? Those are the people that create the safety net of every culture. If I was afraid to be traumatized every time I heard a tragedy of other people, I can't help people who have tragedies. I can't go to the scene of a suicide or homicide and help people. That's not very helpful because somebody's got to do that. I might as well be somebody that's a little bit kooky like me that's willing to do that. Okay? So Colonel Dave Grossman says, people don't want to face unpleasant ideas. So they choose denial as a defense mechanism to say, oh, we'll never have a fire in our house. Our daughter, daughter can never get raped. We'll never have terrorists overrunning our borders and driving around our streets in Toyota Hilux pickup trucks. Nah, that, 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 that's the subject of fiction, fiction books. But it happened and happens and will happen. God forbid it shouldn't happen, but don't be foolish. Don't be naive, be wise. So what's my takeaway? My takeaway is things happen. It's not my opinion. Every country can tell you the statistics of the things that happen in that place on a domestic level and on a national level, on an international level. Look at Corona. Well, that happened. Look in America at mass shootings. That happens. School shootings. That happens. Things happen. My mother was hit once by a car, so apparently that happens. My mother was hit by a car. She's alive. She's she's okay. She was hit by a car. Things happen. Okay? I spoke to somebody yesterday who was raped. That happens. Know what happens. Prepare for it. Learn how danger works and how to personalize those threats to your situation. And then tailor your security to meet those threats and solve those threats. I'm not going to come to this video and say, well, Avi, how should we have a 17-year-old girl be prepared from a rapist? Good question. Maybe we should make a video about it. And I'm not even an expert on that, although I know something about it. It would be a very interesting video, by the way. But you know, at least what I tell my daughter, who's a teenager, I tell her every time she leaves the house and she asks me if it's safe, I say, situational awareness is 90% of the solution of every danger. You have an early warning system. Read the books of Gavin De Becker, The Gift of Fear. Oh, God, is that a good book? The Gift of Fear. I cannot recommend a book better than that book. 
a brilliant book about understanding true danger from danger that Hollywood sold us, from knowing what you can actually do about danger. You don't need to be a commando and have 19 years of supply of food. There's a normal, calm, happy way of doing this. Doesn't have to be extreme. You don't have to be anxious. But I'm just asking, don't be naive. And here's how I'm going to leave off. Guys, I made a video yesterday. I'm helping this country and this nation in different countries. I'm working with people around the world, Jewish, non-Jewish, on a good day. And certainly now and especially Jewish people now, and especially people in Israel, but not only. I'm working with parents in other countries that have kids here, that have soldier children fighting here, that have children living in, in, in Judea and Samaria who are in danger, people up north and down south. I've gone down to the danger zones down south. I've been up north during the Second Lebanon War. I've been down south during many rocket attacks and skirmishes. In this conflict, I'm very involved. I put myself at risk. I'm running a security team to protect my family and my neighbors. But I need help. I'm not God. I can't do everything by myself. And I certainly don't feel good leaving this country to go train people in America in psychological first aid because they're asking me to come help there with the fear and the anti-Semitism there. How could I leave my family here during a war and they're not prepared and they're not safe? How can I leave my house to come to this office and work and they're not safe? Abraham Maslow, a famous psychologist, invented the Maslowian Pyramid of Needs. Maslow's Pyramid of Needs. Google that. He said a very simple idea. He said that people have different levels of needs. You have more basic needs, primal needs, and then you have more abstract needs. If I'm being shot at with a gun and I'm also in need of a girlfriend, which do I need more right now, safety or a girlfriend? I need safety. If I didn't eat in 15 hours, but I also need some business advice, what do I need more right now, food or business advice? I need food. And so Maslow said a very simple idea. I talk about this in my 16-hour course. You want to know more about my course? Sign up on the waiting list. Look on my website. There's a new page on my website about my 16-hour course. Maslow said, you have to deliver people's basic level of needs before you deliver them their more abstract needs. If I show up to the scene of a mass shooting, and I and I responded to those, and I'm speaking to somebody whose clothing is filled with blood of somebody that they did CPR on, because this is a real case that I'm telling you, and they're, and they're filled with red blood all over their hoodie. And they can't stop thinking about how they're all full of blood. And I can't have a conversation with them right now about psychological first aid. They're, they're dirty with somebody's blood. Aside from the trauma, it's, it's not pleasant. Let's clean them off. First, ask the police. But they might need proof and things and take pictures, whatever. I'm not getting into the forensic end of that. But first, clean them off. Make sure they're comfortable. Get them a change of clothes. Put them in a place where the paparazzi isn't taking pictures of them, where they feel safe and calm enough that they're now open mentally for a discussion. Then you can have a discussion. That's what Maslow said. You find the most pressing, primal, instinctive need. You deliver those needs, and then you help them on the next level, and then on the next level, and the next level. I'm helping tens of thousands of people. I'm not special. I'm not trying to get credit from this. But I'm, I'm being honest with you. I don't feel that my neighborhood is safe. I don't have the ability of saying ignorance is blessed because I'm not ignorant. I'm in touch with the law enforcement community, the security community, the military community, people that are sending me open source intelligence and I'm getting this all the time. I have some experience. I have a sense of smell about when we're in danger or not. It, it's not an easy time. OK, I want to know that when I fly to America to help them with their anti-Semitism or I go down south to help the people there or I go to a hotel to help the people who are evacuated from the north or I'm busy giving a Zoom in this office for people. I want to know that my family is safe 
My in-laws who live in the neighborhood are safe. My friends here are safe. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law are safe. I want to know that my cute little three-year-old, that I just put a video of her on Facebook and Instagram, that she's safe. And she won't be raped and won't be butchered. Okay? She won't be burned to death and put in an oven. And you know how I'm going to do that? You know how I'm going to feel safe and, and answer my Maslowian needs? By taking the armed people in this neighborhood who are legally armed, they're law-abiding citizens, they're working under the auspices of the police, so this is not some random extremist militia. It's good people, they keep the laws, the police know their names and addresses, and they're organized together, but they have no, no training. And we're going to offer them training technical training so they know how to hold their gun and tactical training not to become SWAT members but just to know how to defend their house if somebody's breaking in to kill them or how to work together as a pair if they're running down our street with Kalishnikov rifles and you and I have pistols should we intervene and how should we intervene that's all I want and I want 30 people like that around my neighborhood that's all I'm asking and then fundraising money to pay for that, for training. You know what? Because nobody's offering training. And nobody's going to give a walkie-talkie for them to communicate if there's no power. Hezbollah is yelling in their media that they're going to attack all our power. There's going to be no power. Well, I'm going to use WhatsApp to tell these guys to go out in the streets and defend us. There's going to be no WhatsApp. There's going to be no power. So let's have a communication backup. Let's have basic things. I understand these things. And I'm no expert. And I know how to consult with experts. And I have a drive. Yeah. I have a link where we can raise money to create safety for the 75,000 people here. And I want to tell you something else. If I do a good enough job and I need, as a leader, as a role model, people will follow suit. They'll say, wow, that neighborhood is protected. I want to do that too. How come we're not doing that? So please, help me feel safe enough to leave my family by themselves so that I can help the whole rest of the world. And if you want to help Israel and you're not sure what campaign is good and who's doing what and what's happening, I have campaigns and I have things I'm fundraising money for. It's going to help my neighborhood. It's going to help my family. Please, I hope you understood from this video more about preparation, safety, Safety is created. You have to be your own savior. Don't go crazy about it. Don't be anxious about it. Don't go into debt about it. But in a way of curiosity and a hobby and being smart, there's work to do here. And if you're not going to do anything other than what's up, then at the very least, donate some money and help the people that will do it for you. Even though I just said there's no such thing as doing it for you. You should do it for yourself. But there are people that are willing to try to do it for you also. Okay? That was an important topic. It drives a ton of things that I deal with and that I prepare for and that I teach and how I live. I want you to be safe. I want me to be safe. I want my family to be safe. I want everyone to be safe. I want the whole world to have peace and for all of us to be safe. I have no agenda. But safety is something that you create. You don't import, you don't outsource. It has nothing to do with guns, although it's a part of it. It has nothing to do with cameras, although that's a part of it. It has to do with understanding what these things are and seeing that there's 25 different pieces and the putting of all of them together in a responsible way, tailored to your situation, and you being on top of what's going on. There was a great story here in Israel on the sad day of October 7th of a place called Ein Besor. Ain Besor had lawful abiding citizens with guns and a tiny little response team that didn't even have full equipment, didn't have a lot of ammunition, they didn't have a lot of guns. But somebody said, guys, there are terrorists coming to your town. Do something. And the guy in charge of the security force there said, okay. And he gets into different WhatsApp groups and gets on his radios and makes phone calls in the few minutes they had. Everybody with guns, get to the outer perimeter. Shoot any enemy that comes. People with long guns, get to the gate of this town. Get to the main entrance. Point your barrel down 
the bowling alley of where those terrorists are going to come. And the second they come, knock those pins down. And they did. And only one person got injured. A brave guy who was at the forefront of it all. They repelled the invaders, they killed the invaders, and they saved their town. What did that involve? WhatsApp? Some phone calls? A few guns. That's it. That's all it involved. It's not rocket science. And it can be done better and there's different levels. But that's all it involves. Okay? If you have kids in Israel, if you live in this neighborhood, whatever. I hope you learned from this. If you could donate to my campaign, great. If you can't, but you know somebody that could, make a referral. Ask if they can donate. I'd appreciate it, guys. I appreciate that you're on this channel. I appreciate that you listen to me. You're patient with me and you hear me out. I hope I didn't come off as an extremist. I have no political agenda. I want everyone to be safe. I deal with the topic of disaster. That's my work. Disaster and tragedy. Yes, I usually talk about the end of that after it happened. But oh yeah, am I connected to the before the fact that it happened as a first responder, as a father, as a husband. So hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening, guys. Until next time, if you have any questions, send them in. I'd love to make videos for people that follow. Go to my website, psychotraumaunit.com. Use the contact form. Go to the useful links page. You can WhatsApp me. You can whatever. You can write in the comments here, respectfully, of course. And I'll try to make a video. I'll try to answer any questions you have. Thank you guys so much. We should all be safe. Everybody, we should have peace. We should be safe.